Perfect. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Pablo. I'm the Android app lead developer, and I'm here to uh, tell you about the rule engine and how to use it with the SDK. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce to you uh, a little overview of what the program rules are and how they are used in the DHIS2. Uh, so, uh, the program rules is a way to uh, evaluate the current state of uh, data entry form um, and respond to that state with a series of actions and effects. Um, so just a little, little uh, picture here to, to let you see the, the, whole, uh, the whole thing. So we back from that context, for example, an enrollment which has its own enrollment date, enrolling organization unit, uh, the enrollment has a status that can be active, completed, and it has a series of events with uh, values. Then the user is in the data entry, can be an, an event or the, on the, or the enrollment form. Um, and these events has their own uh, event date, uh, data values, organization unit, category combinations, and based on these sets of data, the program rules can be evaluated and they can respond with a series of, of effects, can be assigning a value to a variable, uh, hiding a field, showing a warning, and many more. They're all in the uh, DHS2 uh, documentation. The main part of the program rules is the expression is where everything is evaluated. Uh, the program rule expression uh, is the way to evaluate this context and it gets uh, a series of variable uh, that conform an expression which has to be evaluated to true or false. Uh, it can use, as I said, some variables that are linked to uh, mostly to data elements or attributes. Uh, it can use uh, special functions, uh, um, and as I said, it, they have to be evaluated to true or false. So, how does this this works in 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 Android? So, for uh, to evaluate the program rules, we use uh, the rule engine. Uh, this is a Java library which has developed by the UIO, and you have the repository link uh, in, this, in this presentation, so you will be able to, to have a look at it. So I want to remind that the rule engine, as for now, is not part of the SDK, it's its own um, library. Uh, it has its own uh, Java classes, so we need to translate some of these classes from the SDK to the rule engine models, and then rule actions and effects uh, have to be uh, carried out by the developer. So the rule engine is going to evaluate the program rules and tell you what to do, but it's up to the developer to apply those rules to their fields, to whatever fields you have created. Um, the rule engine uses the, uh, the Antler expression, uh, expression evaluation parser, which is also a library uh, from the UIO. And this expression parser takes care of, of the rule engine expression of the rule engine expressions and evaluates it to, to, to true or false. Uh, this is also shared between Android and backend, uh, not web. Web has its own implementation. Um, so we can be mostly sure that uh, if something works in Android, it's also going to work on in for the backend. Uh, the rule engine needs uh, to step initialization when you're using it in the in an Android application. Uh, first, you have uh, the metadata configuration that uh, creates or that is used to build a, what is called rule engine context. The rule engine context are that data that is not going to change to the uh, data in, in the real data entry. Um, then uh, the second step would be adding the contextual data for the rule engine. That would mean is uh, what do you want to evaluate with this context? Do you want to evaluate the, for example, an enrollment? Do you want to evaluate a single event or you want to evaluate everything within this context? 
uh, the, the relating context uh, setup is, as you can see, uh, very simple. You need to provide a list of program, uh, program rule variables. Uh, these variables uh, are linked to attributes, um, data, element for, data element for an event, and you have several different cases. Then you have to provide the list of rules you want to evaluate. This usually will be uh, linked to either a program or a program stage. Uh, then you will have to add some what is called supplementary data. This would be, for example, the user roles, the some or units uh, codes that the that the rule engine would need to be able to evaluate some of these uh, functions that you can use in the expressions. And then finally, um, you will have also to provide a, any constant value that is uh, available in, in the metadata. Uh, for example, if, you, if in web the, the number P is uh, configured, then you, you have to pass that uh, in, this, in this list. Uh, with this, you have the, the rule engine context. What you can do with the rule engine context is building the, the rule engine. So this is the second step. Uh, you, just would, you just would need to call the two engine builder and then build, and you can pass to uh, one of these two um, uh, other uh, objects, like for example, if you would want to um, evaluate uh, program rules within an enrollment, you will need to uh, add it to the rule engine, like enrollment and passing the enrollment. And also you will have to add all the events within that enrollment. So the, the rule engine knows what's going on. If you are in a um, program without registration, a single event program, you won't pass the, the enrollment, but we, you will pass all of the events from, the, uh, from that uh, program. And finally, with the, with the rule engine object uh, already set up, uh, you can use it to evaluate uh, a, 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 with a, a context using uh, one of these functions. There are a lot of uh, uh, evaluate functions available. The, the uh, most common free way would be uh, dot evaluate, which will evaluate everything within the uh, rule engine context. Uh, you can pass it the current enrollment. Um, this is done like, uh, like this because as you add new data to the enrollment form, you would need to be uh, uh, updating this enrollment object uh, and the same with the event. Um, there's also several other evaluate functions that will, will let you pass a set of program rules. You like, I, I just want to evaluate this program rule and nothing else. It's also, it's also there for you to use. But the three main uses would be these ones. Um, so how we connect the SDK to the rule engine? Uh, apart from uh, repeating that it, this is a, a library, uh, so the SDK uh, knows nothing about the, the rule engine. Uh, the SDK have already its own variables for, for models that the rule engine uses. For example, uh, in the SDK, we have the program rule variable, the program rule, enrollment and event that you have already seen. Uh, the rule engine has its own model implementation for rule variable, rule, rule event, and rule enrollment. Uh, so we need in the app, uh, in the Android app, like a translation class or a mapping class. So for example, uh, in the SDK, we have the program rule variable, which has a property called program rule variable source type. And this would be have to be to take into account for in the mapping uh, to transform this model into one of those uh, from the rule engine that would be rule variable attribute, rule variable calculated value, rule variable current event, and there are several others. So this has to be done uh, in the Android app. Uh, so what happens once we uh, have the rule engine and we ask them to, to evaluate? Uh, 
uh, what we receive from the rule engine is a list of uh, rule effects. Uh, this rule effect, each of these rule effect has a rule action object. There are the, uh, th like 13 different types. They are rule action height field, uh, rule action assign, rule action height section, rule action show error, uh, uh, and many more. And each of them have its own variables, like saying which field you have to target and what do you have to do with that. Uh, and then uh, the rule effect it, uh, it has also a, a, string, a data stream, uh, which in, for some cases is the result of an evaluated expression that you need to display as a static text. Um, just an, like an example, the, the rule action height field uh, has uh, this property content which is a message you have to the to show the user when when a field is going to be hidden, and then it also has the property field, uh, which is the UID of the element of the data element or actually you do you need to hide. Um, so when we receive this uh, this effect, what we have to do is go to our list of field, find this field with that UID, and remove it from the list. And then maybe I don't know, showing a pop up to the user with with the message that that they actually require. Uh, this is all well documented in in the rule engine uh, documentation and in DHH two docs. Um, something to take into account when working with with the rule engine uh, is that we have to clear data when 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 it is hidden. So this is something we, like the way we work with the rule engine in the Android app is that when each time the user add a, a data in the form, it is stored locally in the in the SDK database. So when we get a height, say, a height field um, a, a effect, if we don't clear that value, we don't remove that value from the from the SDK uh, uh, and we sync, that value is going to go to the to the server, and we don't want that because the pro a program rule already said that that value sh should shouldn't exist. Uh, next thing you have to know is that program rules configuration can have issues, like uh, if a program rule hasn't been completely fully configured in web. It can be downloaded to the Android app uh, with the SDK, and it may provoke some failures when uh, when triggered. Mm, these are really uh, difficult to uh, to debug, so you have to take that into account. Uh, for example, when you use uh, the mapping the mapping classes to, to, par to pass from from SDK models to rule engine model. Um, also, you have to be careful with possible loops. You know, when a, when something changes in the in the in the form in the data, you should be run in a next iteration of the of the rule engine. And if you have program rules that assign and then hide the same value, you can be stuck in a loop. So you have to have something in mind to to avoid this. And, and then the, the last thing, which I, I have already said at the beginning, uh, although the rule engine expression evaluation is set between Android and, and backend, uh, the web has a different implementation. Uh, when you're configuring the, the program rules expressions in, uh, from 235, there is a check that is using the same expression evaluator like Android and backend. So that would be a way to, to know if everything is okay. But for previous version of DHH2 and having the program rules run, web has its own implementation. So you may see some difference uh, here and there that we are trying to uh, mitigate in, uh, as much as we can. But it's something that, that could happen. Um, here, uh, just to, to, to end this pre little presentation, uh, I've, 
uh, I prepared you with a list of uh, links to the DHIS2 Android app, uh, so you can check how the rule engine is implemented. Um, I think you have there everything you would need in order to implement the rule engine to whatever app you want to, to build. So you have access to how the rule engine context is, is built for an enrollment, uh, how uh, the evaluation is performed uh, during an enrollment, and then the last two Kotlin classes, uh, you could use it uh, very straightforward. They are the uh, how we apply the, the rule first to a list of fields and uh, this mapping class uh, to, to parts from uh, SDK models to, to rule engine models. So these classes, you, will, you could just copy the, the code and, and you would be okay to, to use them, but they are in Kotlin. Um, that would be it. Thank you very much. Uh, this has no exercise. So any question you have, this is the moment. Okay, so no, no question. Okay, thank you, Pablo. You're welcome. Okay, so let's continue with the next session. Um, this, this is also about uh, some utility classes and services and helpers that are around the development of the Android application. Um, so, um, what, what I'm talking about, uh, services, uh, I mean, some, some logic some services helpers or engines like the rule engine that are around, uh, the SDK that helps with the logic, uh, that is related to DHS2. Um, for example, in, uh, well, in the previous day, we have seen uh, how to create new events, how to create values, how to create targeted instances. But uh, it is true that there is a, a DHS2 logic that uh, has to be taken into account uh, to allow the users to do some things. For example, uh, if a targeted instance is already enrolled in a program, uh, that CI cannot be enrolled again in the same program while it, uh, that CI has an active enrollment, things like that. Or if the event is not repeatable, you should not allow the user to get a new event. So for that, um, we have some services like the event service that provides some helpful uh, methods like to check if an event is editable or not. So what do we have to check? What, what if we if we do it on our own, uh, what do we have to check? Okay, so to determine if an event is can be edited or not, uh, first of all, you have to verify if the user has data right access to the program. Also, if the enrollment linked to the to that event is active because if if the enrollment is completed, the event cannot be modified. If the registration unit uh, also has opening and closing date, and if the event date is within that range. Also, if the user has access to the attribute option combo linked to the event, which means that the user has to to have access to all the category options linked to that attribute option combo. And also, finally, in case the category options uh, have a start and end date, you have to check if the event date falls within that range. So as you, as you can see, there is a lot of things to take into account when you want to, to, to know if an event can be edited or not. So this method, uh, encapsulate 
all this logic and just give you a result. Okay, this event can be edited or this event cannot be edited. And the reason is that one. Okay, the enrollment service. Uh, uh, for example, to check if, uh, if a user can access or edit an enrollment. And it will depend on the access level of the program, open protected flows. Also the, the data access uh, of the user to the program. Also, depending on the access level of the program, uh, you have to check the organization unit. If the organization unit is in the capture scope or in the search scope, change. So yeah, so all these things uh, you need to take into account to, to know if uh, the uh, user can edit or access an enrollment. And also we have help, uh, helpers for that. For that. And the period helper, uh, for example, there is uh, this helper includes handy methods to get the days in a period. For example, if the month has 30 or 31 days or 28. Also to get a period or period ID based on a period type and a date to get this unique the, the identifier with, uh, with a syntax that expects CSS2. And also they get a period value ID and or get all the periods available for this data set, taking into account the future periods of the data set. Also, there is a, a geometry helper uh, because uh, I think starting on a version 230 or 232, uh, the geometry model has changed. And now it includes point, polygon, or multipolygon. And the geometry object uh, becomes, becomes more complex. So the, this helper helps with the uh, with uh, yeah, with, with uh, this object, for example, to validate if, uh, if the feature type is polygon, okay, these coordinates are valid for a polygon, or if it's of type point, these coordinates are actually a point. So yeah, this helper uh, helps you to validate the, the geometric object to extract the points, polygon or, polygons or multipolygons and also create new valid geometry objects as well. And finally, the relationship helper that, uh, yeah, starting on version 230, uh, the relationship model changed a lot. Uh, previously, you can only have relationships between a TI and a TI. Now you can have a relationship between a TI enrollment or event to a TI enrollment or event. So yeah, the, the object is more complex and this helper helps you with all that logic. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, any question about this, these services? We are not doing any exercise about this. It's just for you to know that those services uh, are there for you to to use them and yeah, that we have all these things to deal with uh, the data to logic uh, one question please yes do we have uh, the kind of service for aggregates Sorry, can you repeat do we have service for aggregate uh, facts i see that you only show service for factor well uh, yeah for the aggregated part well, the period helper helps a lot in the aggregated part because um, yeah, when you want to to list, for example, the periods available for a particular data set, depending on the period type of the data set, and the period helper helps with that. Um, and also, yeah, we have the, well, the validation rule engine that we saw yesterday, and also the data set indicator engine that we are not going to see in this workshop, but it's also there. 
Um, yeah, but that's all. Uh, some other things that are coming in the next version, for example, is a value type helper that helps in the validation of the value type. For example, if, uh, if it's integer positive uh, or it's a date or, or I don't know, uh, a coordinate, it helps you to validate the values. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Any other question? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, this session is about uh, the program indicator engine. Uh, this is also uh, this is another engine that we have in the, in the SDK, and this engine um, takes care of the evaluation of the prime indicator, but in the only in the context of uh, of a, a single TI, and usually or or an event, and usually for the data entry form. I mean that uh, this prime indicator engine is intended to be used to evaluate those indicators that are shown in the data entry screen. Uh, if you if you think you have in mind the web form, uh, there is a, a box showing a list of prime indicators uh, during the data entry uh, in the data entry form. So this engine is for that is to evaluate the indicators shown in the data entry form. Uh, so far, it's not possible to evaluate prime indicators across all the track identity instances, but it's something that is coming. And, and also a, a good thing about this engine is that it, it uses the, the this share parser that we have talked about in previous sessions and also that Pablo mentioned for the root engine is a is the common grammar that is served by the backend and by Android. So you could expect to have the same result both in in Android and in the and in the backend when it comes to the parsing of the expression. Um, the prime indicator engine is very easy to use. The, it is located in the program module, prime indicator engine, and it has two methods. And the first is to, to evaluate uh, a prime indicator in the context of an event. And, and, and this is used for um, events without registration, usually. And the second one is for, for enrollment. Uh, and this these are the indicators that are shown in the, in the tracker capture app in web. Indicators that are evaluated in the context of a, a whole enrollment. Okay, so, so let's do an exercise about this. Um, let me... Let me... Um, Okay, so welcome to this session about analytics. So here we are going to see um, a new feature that was introduced in the SDK in, uh, in the last version in 1.4. And it is uh, an initial, yeah, an initial module to, with some basic analytics uh, features. So, um, the, the purpose of this model is to to be able to have some kind of analytic values based on the values stored on the device. Uh, I mean that uh, yeah, this model will evaluate uh, prime indicators or indicators, uh, but always based on the data stored in the device. So it does not take the values 
in the server, just the, the values that are present in the device. This is important. Uh, maybe, I don't know, in future versions, we can uh, combine uh, that data coming from the server and the device, but currently, the current scope is just to analyze um, data in the device. Um, this similar this functionality uh, tries to be similar to the analytic endpoint in the web API. So maybe you are familiar with that endpoint. So you can have kind of analytic event line list or in tabular form and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> so far in the in version 1.4, and uh, what we have introduced is the event line list analytics. So um, this kind of analytics gives you uh, usually a list of events with evaluated values, like for example, a prime indicator for that particular event or the data, ele data element, things like that. So you can print in a list the event in a, in a table, or you can build a, a graph like this to see the evolution. For example, uh, in the context of a TI, you can see the evolution of a particular prime indicator across all the events. So yeah, and it's, it's very similar. Uh, if you are familiar with web, uh, very similar to the event report line list functionality. So you can have the, yeah, all the events in a line, in the line, uh, with the prime indicators that you want or the, and the data elements that you want. And yeah, and the, and the main use case, I would say that is to print the information about uh, repeatable stages so you can see the evolution of some values. And this is a capture of the Android capture app. Uh, and screenshot. And yeah, and yeah, these values are evaluated using the analytic model in the SDK, uh, but the representation in a graph is the responsibility of the application. Well, the, the event line list uh, analytic repository is quite easy to, to use. Uh, it has uh, a mandatory property, just one, that is the promise state. So you have to, to define the promise state that you want to, uh, that you want to evaluate. So it's the only uh, mandatory property. Uh, additionally, you can specify the promise, the tracked entity instance. For example, if you want to to display the evolution of a value in the context of a tracked entity instance, you can filter by tracked entity instance, and then you can add uh, the data element and the prom indicator that you want. Um, the syntax is the same that for any other repository this builder pattern with data element. Data element, if you add more than one data element or more than one prime indicators, uh, they are concatenated. So in this case, you will have both data element one and data element two in the response and the prime indicator. Okay, so that's all for this uh, initial yeah, and I think it's more that we have in the SDK. Okay.